thank you, our, our, our musicians and praise team. What a great job they did this morning with music and worship. I tell you, that really helped us to be able to uh, worship together when we've got great music. Uh, I can tell you, I've been in places in which, you know, music about killed the service, you know. And so thank you, Gary and praise team, for, for blessing our hearts as we lift up the Lord's name and sing hallelujah to the Savior. I hope your heart has been blessed and encouraged as we get into the Word of God. Well, listen, we're in a brand new year, and we've started a new challenge as we started the year, encouraging you to follow along with us in a 21-day uh, devotional challenge as we're working through some of the Psalms, and we're praying some bold prayers. And I hope that you've been part of that, and we're going to continue that this week. Now, we've been talking in the worship services about the bold prayers that pray. And last week we talked about that first bold prayer, and that prayer being, Lord, search me. That is, we're asking God to kind of strip back the veneer from our life and expose to us who we really are. Uh, the problem is we have a tendency to think better of ourselves than we should, and uh, when we think everything is okay, we don't make the adjustments that we need to become better to become stronger, to become more in line with God's word. And so that prayer was, God, please show me the reality so that I can be more like Jesus Christ. Now, today we're going to talk about a second prayer, and I'm going to let you know up front, you're not going to like this. Okay, So just so understand, if you're expecting you're going to like this, you're not going to like this. Okay. In fact, some of you aren't even going to participate in, in this prayer because you're not going to like it that much. Okay. But I believe it's an important prayer. It is a bold prayer. It is not one of those easy prayers that we oftentimes pray. It's not one of the, these prayers that say God should make our lives better again. That's kind of indicative of, of uh, American Christianity. You know, God, you should make my life better. And if I serve you, everything gets better. Uh, that's kind of the prayer we pray. But it's not one of those easy prayers. Now, easy prayers are okay. I mean, I, I pray easy prayers, too, just like you. You know, Lord, um, uh, make me feel better. Lord, help me have a good day. Uh, Lord, keep me safe. Lord, keep my family safe. Lord, help provide this need. You know, Lord, give me a good parking spot. You know, those type of prayers. We all, we all pray those, and those are fine to, to pray those type of things. But this isn't one of those prayers. This is, this is a hard prayer. This is a, a, a not a safe prayer. This is a dangerous prayer. This is a very, very, very bold prayer that we're going to talk about. In fact, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's scary to pray this kind of prayer. And I want you to invite, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me this week, and it's this prayer. Lord, break me. Lord, break my heart. That's a bold prayer. That's a prayer, like I said, that some of you are just, you know, you're like, well, not for me, somebody else, okay? But this is a prayer we're going to look at this morning. So I want to um, us to look at a man that was in the Bible whose heart was broken. He was known as the weeping prophet, okay? His name was Jeremiah, okay, the weeping prophet, because as he began to share the message that God had. It was such a hard message, such a difficult message, that he took no pleasure in delivering it. And his heart literally was crushed by the fact that he had to say these things and noted the condition of the people. He lived in a day and age in which it was very, very difficult to live a godly life in the nation of Israel. Israel... Um, the, the northern kingdom had already been carried into captivity, and now the southern kingdom, Judah here, is still free, but they're not very far away from being taken into captivity, and God's judgment was about to come upon them. And so he's beginning to see all the things that are leading up to this, and it's breaking his heart. And so I want to invite you, if you have your copy of God's Word, to go with me to Jeremiah, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 8. There's a lot we could say here, but we're going to be in chapter 8 this morning. 
And here we see a man whose heart is broken. And his brokenness can be transferable to us in so many different ways. Here's the takeaway that I want you to get as we go through this message this morning. It's simply this. Your heart should break over something that breaks the heart of God. Now, hearts break over lots of different things. You know, your team loses or, or you know, you don't get the, your way or whatever, and our hearts break over those different things. But our hearts ought to break over something that really breaks the heart of God. Now, Jeremiah, he's ministering during this time, and it's hard for him to minister during this because of the condition of the nation of Judah. Judah's leaders and their people, according to the book, did evil in the sight of the Lord. They were turning away from the things of God. In fact, it had gotten so bad that in Israel, in Judah, many of them were worshiping false gods to the extent that they were literally taking their infant children and throwing them into the fire as a sacrifice to a pagan god. Can you imagine taking one of your kids, you know, your little babies, well, maybe you can on a really bad day, but no, no. But I mean, literally, they took their, 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 their child and incinerated them. This is Israel. This isn't some pagan devil-worshipping nation. This is a place where they would go to the temple and worship, and then they take and they throw their kids in the fire to worship a false and pagan god. And there was a lot of evil and injustice that was taking place. They were treating people unfairly. They were um, abusing um, the poor and the elderly. That was rampant taking place there. And it was these conditions that precipitated God having to move and bring judgment upon the nation of Judah. And so this is what he's facing. This is what led to God's judgment. Verse 18 says this. Jeremiah says, When I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Let me put it this way. Another translation says this about the verse. It says, My grief is beyond healing. My heart is broken. And that's what he's saying. I, I, am, I am so grieving that there's no cure for it. My heart has been obliterated because of what he saw. His heart's breaking because God's heart was broken. Now understand, this was not just simply an awareness or an annoyance of what's going on. His heart was gripped by it. I mean, this moved him emotionally. It wasn't one of those things that says, oh, well, or yeah, I know about this. This is one of the things that just upset him. And he began to feel it in his body. Tears began to come out of his eyes. He began to feel sick. He began to shake. He began to, to, to feel and gripped with the capacity that he had to understand that this problem in the country was of a grave nature. You know, for us, as we look in our, our time, it's really easy for us to become so familiar, so common with the things that are happening that offend God that we become, well, apathetic. Yeah, I, I know this is happening. And it's happening again, and it's happening again. And pretty soon we know that it's happening, but it really doesn't move us. Because every day on the news we hear about reports of violence. We hear about crime. We hear about tragedies, and if we're not careful, you know what happens? We become desensitized. It doesn't... Few things shock us anymore, right? I mean, people can use the vulgarest of language, and we're like, yeah, heard it probably said it at one time, you know. We look at such of the, the gravest of tragedies, and we're like, yeah, that's too bad. That's awful. I hate that. I don't like that. But, but it really doesn't 
move us. And if we're not careful, folks, we can become indifferent to the things that are offending God. And that's why we need to pray, Lord, break me. Lord, help me not to be okay with what I'm seeing. Help me not to be apathetic to those things. Help me not to be indifferent. So what was it that broke Jeremiah's heart? What was it that he saw that truly crushed his heart for God? Well, we're going to discover in our message today that in some form, the very things that Jeremiah observed, we will be able to observe in our own nation, and yes, in our own life. And so I want us to look today at um, several things that I believe are going to, to be eye-openers for us. And again, I want us to remember that your heart should break over something that breaks the heart of God. So I want us to notice as we go through this chapter five things that were breaking the heart of God. Five things that were breaking the heart of God that ought to be breaking your heart and my heart today. Jeremiah chapter 8, go down to verse 5. And here's what he says. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. Here's the first one. That is unrepentant sin. The first thing that broke his heart was that he looked at his people and he saw that they had unrepentant sin. Now, hear me. The problem wasn't that they were sinning. The problem was they were sinning and they refused to repent. Okay? They refused to return, as, as he says in that verse. Now, all of us sin. That's not a news flash. That's not an epiphany. Every day, you and I do something probably that offends God, either in word, deed, or thought. Every day, we've got something. I mean, unless you're you know, an angelic being, I think all of us have things that we, at the end of the day, realize, I probably shouldn't have done that. I know that was wrong. I did it anyway. And so we all sin, but do we repent of that sin? Now, repentance is not admitting the sin, okay, it is, it is action. Okay? It's not just saying it, it's, it's something more than that. It's doing it. I don't just say repentance, I do repentance. It's I'm in this direction that's leading me away from God and away from His commands, and repentance says I'm now going in the opposite direction. And he said in this verse that Judah was in a perpetual backsliding, that instead of just, it wasn't just a, an oops or one-time thing, Judah was on an ongoing trajectory away from God, continuing to move away and away from the Lord. And they had no intentions of stopping. And they weren't sorry for what they were doing. It's sort of like your kids, parents. Remember when your kids got into a disagreement or maybe they were said something unkind or they wouldn't share or they did something wrong and you'd say to one kid to the other, tell your sister you're sorry, tell your brother I'm so you're sorry, right? And were they sorry? No, they weren't sorry. Say it, I'm sorry. You know, they, they, they didn't mean it whatsoever. They said the words, but they had no intention of being sorry. They just said it because you made them do it. Judah was that way. Judah would go through the religious motions of, of saying that they were sorry, but in reality, they were not. They didn't care. And they continued moving away from God. So let me ask you, does your heart break when you see unrepentant sin? Are the things in our nation that you're seeing take place that break your heart because you see our nation going in a direction far from God and re 
refusing to repent. Let me take it a little bit personal. Do you see things in your own life that oftentimes you know you need to change direction, but you're not? That ought to break your heart. That ought to disturb you. That ought to upset you. You see how your sin breaks the heart of the Father. And are you willing to pray, Lord, break me? Here's the second thing that they saw in verse 9. And he says, the wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord. What wisdom is in them? Here's the second thing, rejecting the word. They were unrepentant of their sin, and they rejected the very word of God. At the root cause of Judah's refusal to repent was that they had rejected God's word. Hear me, there are many today that will acknowledge the Bible as God's word, but they refuse to accept it as the authority in their life. You ask them, well, yeah, the Bible's the Word of God, so what does that mean? That means whatever it says, I need to be doing. and Whatever it says I shouldn't do, I ought not be doing. But they don't take it as that. And so instead of practicing biblical obedience, what many people do today, as they did in Judah's day, is they practice religion. Religion says, I can do religious stuff, I can do these ritualistic things, and that's a substitute for the hard things, right? I'm here at church, so I get some brownie points because I'm physically here, okay? And that's a good thing, you ought to be here. But God also wants you to, to, to be just as, as alert of his presence when you leave this place. Obedience goes beyond that. And so Jeremiah says, the wise men, these guys that were supposed to be so smart, aren't so smart after all. They aren't very wise. Now wisdom, whenever the Bible talks about it, wisdom isn't just knowing truth. Wisdom isn't just saying, I know what the Bible says, and I can quote it. Okay, That's not wisdom. Wisdom is is the fact of applying that truth. It's saying, I know what the Bible says, and I know how I'm supposed to be doing it. It's not the knowing, it's the doing. Judah was doing certain things, but they weren't doing what God said to do. You see, you cannot treat the Word of God like it's a vitamin supplement. A verse a day keeps the devil away. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a verse, and so that devil's gone now. It's like I took my, my vitamin C this morning, and so I'm, doing, I'm good. It's not like that. The Bible isn't magic. Oh, if I quote this verse, the devil will flee from me. So devil, here, here's a verse, and I'm going to read this verse, da, 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 and the devil goes, oh, no, oh, no, he quoted the verse. I have to go away. No, the Bible's not some magic thing like Aladdin where he says, You know, open sesame and the cave opens up. That's not what he's talking about. The Bible is meant for us to hear it, but to also to do it. That's what James later in the New Testament would tell us, right? In James chapter 1 and verse 22, remember what James says? But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James says we deceive ourselves because some of you think, well, I'm in church and I'm hearing the sermon and so I'm good to go. And and James says, no, that's only part of it. Right now you're hearing the sermon and as you walk out these doors, God says, okay, now it's time for part two. I want you to now live it out. So you really haven't completed it until you live it out. And that's what Judah was doing is they knew the word, but they ignored it. And God's heart breaks every time we hear his word and then we ignore 
what he says. We hear God's word being preached and God says, I want you to change. I want you to be like this. I want you to be more like this. I want you to turn from your direction and you put your foot down. We become busy. We become preoccupied with with our life and what's going on. We don't have time, so we think, to do that. Do you get too busy to read your Bible? Well, you know, I, I got to go to work early and I've got things going on. Well, yeah, but let me just tell you, if you're too busy to read your Bible and pray, you're too busy. You need to cut something out. You need to make some time. Do you get so preoccupied that you can't obey what God tells us to do? That's a danger. Once again, I want to urge you, your heart should break over something that breaks the heart of God. Are you unrepentant? Do you reject the word of God? That breaks God's heart. God cares about those things, and so should we. Number three, look at verse 20, if you would. Skip down there. And he makes this statement. The harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. Here's the third thing that he tells us. Neglected opportunities. Neglected opportunities. In this verse, harvest and summer are two different seasons. In the summer, or excuse me, in the harvest time, they would bring out the grain, they would harvest that, and in the summer would be the fruits that they would gather. Okay, two different things. There was really a narrow time period when the crops were ripe to harvest them before they became spoiled. Either they would just go bad or some pestilence would get a hold of them. And so when it was time to harvest, you had to go out and gather the stuff and bring it in. Okay, And so what, what the, Jeremiah is trying to say is, Judah, God has given you harvests and you have wasted these opportunities. Well, how so? Well, God began to send prophets. And the prophets began to tell you, hey, Judah, things aren't right. You're, you, you're not repenting. Judah, you're rejecting the word of God. He sent in the prophets there. And if you'll repent, and if you'll obey the word of God, then then God will bless you. Instead, they rejected it. And so, even though the harvest and summer is here, he says, we are not saved. In other words, it's over, guys. No more lives. No more tokens to put in the game. No more plays. It's like the big sign that goes up that says, game over. It's over. It's done. You had the opportunity to gather what you needed, but you didn't do it. You didn't take advantage of those opportunities, and it's done. We need to understand that the opportunities that you have today may not be available later. How many times have we made that statement? Well, one day I'm going to do this. One day I'm going to stop whatever. I'm going to stop being mean or I'm going to, you know, stop whatever it may be that you're doing that you shouldn't, you know. Now, nobody here would ever say that. But, you know, one day I'm going to do this. One day I'm going to really, I'm going to serve God. One day I'm going to volunteer to serve. One day I'm going to spend some time reading my Bible. One day I'm going to read the Bible all the way through. One day I'm going to get to the point that I pray every day. One day I'm going to share my faith. And and we set these one-day type things, and then we have a litany of excuses why we can't do it. Well, I'm busy, or I got this going on, or this happening. You know what? The problem is that one day may never happen. You may never reach that. Well, why? Well, lots of stuff can happen between now and one day, right? Some of you are experiencing that right now. You're going through things in your life right now that you never anticipated were going to happen. And you, you looked at your, your calendar, and it's like, wow, my calendar didn't say I was going to have surgery on this day. But you did. 
And your calendar didn't say you're going to lose your job on this day, but you did. And your calendar didn't say you're going to develop this physical ailment on this day, but you did. There's a host of things that happen if we don't take advantage of the opportunities that we have. I mean, can, can we think of a better example than 2020? Who anticipated at, at, in January of last year COVID? Nobody. And we, as a church, we were rocking along with, with, with hitting goals. We had set specific uh, achievement goals as a congregation, and man, we were checking off all the boxes, and we were moving great uh, forward with the things of God for that. And then COVID came. Things change. They change in your family. They change in our nation. They change politically. They change in your finances. They change in your health. God's heart breaks when we neglect the opportunities that he sends our way. When he opens those doors... And I'm telling you, even in the midst of what we're facing now, there are opportunities that are there. The problem is sometimes we're not looking for any opportunities. We've just decided that we can't do anything in this context, and so we're not even going to bother to look. And God says, you're breaking my heart. Because in every situation, no matter what the cause is, God always provides opportunities for his people. We just get so kind of enamored that this is how we have to function and this is what we do. And God says, I understand that, but we're going to change things up. And we're like, whoa, whoa, God. We don't do it that way. Listen, you don't tell God what he does and doesn't do. You just say, yes, Lord, and you follow. What opportunities have been available that we have ignored? Lord, break me so I see those opportunities. Lord, break me. Here's the next one, verse 21. For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold of me. Here's the next one. Self-destructive behavior. Self-destructive behavior. Jeremiah is hurting. And why is he hurting? He's hurting because the people of his nation are now hurting. Why is God hurting? Because now the people that of God, who he loves, are hurting. Why are they hurting? They are hurting because of their own self-destructive behavior. They are facing the hurt in their life because of what they are doing. He says in there, I'm black. That is, it, it's the color of mourning. You know, when, when we go to funerals, you wear dark colors. Somebody died, and God says, yeah, it's time to, to mourn. I, I'm, I'm astonished. I have astonishment. That is, I, I am overwhelmed. I am overcome with grief. Why? Because of their sinful behavior. Sinful behavior. The Babylonians are going to come now. They're going to take you into captivity. And you're going to really be sorry. You're going to really be hurt. And why are they there? Because of the decisions that Judah made that hurt themselves. And because of that, Jeremiah hurts. And God hurts. It's sort of like the parent-child relationship. Parents, you understand this. There are times in which you witness your children making bad choices, bad decisions. And it's not that you're the most smartest person in the world, but you've lived long enough that you know that that decision is going to lead them to a place of hurt. You see it. You know it's going to be there. And you're hurt because they've made the bad decision. Maybe they got a bad grade because they didn't study. And you're like, I knew that was going to happen. I told you to study. I told you to prepare. 
and you didn't, and now you're all upset. That, oh, my, I got a bad grade. What did you expect? Or maybe you saw they're hanging around the wrong friends. And you know what these friends are like, and you've warned them about it, and yet they've picked the wrong friends. And you know what's going to happen eventually when they hang around the wrong group. And so you hurt because you know they're going to hurt at some point. Or maybe, maybe it was something they were given and they just didn't take care of it. Maybe it was their, a car, or maybe it was some kind of thing that they owned and they just neglected the maintenance of it, they didn't take care of it properly, and now it's broken down, and now what was important for them can't be achieved because they didn't do what they should do. And now your heart breaks that they're going to miss out on the opportunity, and yet as a parent you saw that coming. Or maybe, maybe it's not your kids, maybe it's you, or maybe it's somebody else, and you see their behavior. And they made a promise that they didn't keep. And what that did is that, that, that ruined that relationship. They were counting on you. You promised to show up. You promised to be there. And then you didn't. Now the pain comes. Why? Because you made the wrong choice. Your own, your own behavior destructed it. It wasn't the devil did it. It wasn't like, oh, the devil came in and, and, and ruined our plans. No, you did it. You said it. You failed to go here. You failed to do what you should do. And what's more than it, you already knew what was going to happen. You knew that people weren't going to applaud at that decision. Not because it was the right decision, but because you knew it was the wrong decision, but you did it anyway. God's heart is breaking. Jeremiah's heart is broken. There are many things that God tells us that he wants us to do, and if we ignore those things, we end up hurting the people that we love, and pretty soon we end up in a place we never intended to be. And for some people, you keep ignoring what God says. God says, I want you to fellowship. I want you to be part of the church. I want you to be part of this group. And you keep pushing it and pushing it away. And here's the real problem when you begin to miss church. Okay? The problem of missing church is that soon you won't miss it. You say, well, Pastor, I'm in church. Listen, can I tell you, you can be here and not be here? There are some of you sitting in church right now, and you're not here. You're elsewhere. You're, you're thinking about lunch. You're thinking about this afternoon. You're thinking about something else. But you're not here. You've come to get out. And one day, if you continue that attitude, church will be irrelevant to you. Some of our young people, when they grow up, they'll, they'll walk out these doors, and they'll never go back to any church because it just doesn't matter. There are a lot of people that, that use excuses. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling well, or I've, I've got this issue, or i got that, and pretty soon what happens is it doesn't matter to them. I see it all the time here. I see people that were very faithful doing something, and then when something comes up, maybe they got a, a schedule change. Maybe they used to come to Grow Group, and then they couldn't because they, they, they had a schedule change or something, and then the schedule change goes back to normal, and guess what? They don't come back to grow group because it doesn't matter to them anymore. I hope that's not the case. But understand that when you are hurting, God and others are hurting also. Now here's the last one that he saw. Verse 22. <clears throat> Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Now, Jeremiah here is looking towards the east. He's looking towards the town of Gilead. Now Gilead in his day was known 
for their healing ointment. They had an ointment that they used. They derived it from uh, some of the uh, trees that they had there. And they were renowned for this ointment that would be put on wounds for healing and the care that they would receive. It was there. And so what Gilead became in, his, in that culture was a symbol, a symbol of hope, a symbol of cure, a symbol of remedy. It's sort of like we look at certain establishments today, and you look at like maybe the innovative cures that you find at Mayo Clinic. Or if your kid has cancer, you go to St. Jude's Hospital, whatever, and you look at that, and they're, and they're like beacons of hope and help. And it was there. But here's the problem. They refused the cure. They wouldn't take the cure. In this illustration, Jeremiah is saying that God had provided a cure for the coming judgment. It was repentance. But Judah would not apply it to their heart. They refused it. Here's the bomb. Here's the physician. Here's the help that I've provided. But they would not do it. And it's just like us refusing help. How many times do you go to the doctor and the doctor says, here's what I want you to do, and you go, nah, I'm not going to do it. And then you never get better. Or the doctor says, here's the medicine. Here's the vaccine for you to take. Oh, I don't believe in those things. Here it is. I'm giving you this. I'm, I'm providing the very means of helping you to recover. And you're saying, no, I'm not going to receive it. Well, what if it is, what about in your marriage? And your marriage is struggling. And God says, I'll, I'll give you some counsel that will help you with it. But just don't go to Don St. Pierre. Okay, okay. If you were in his class this morning, you, you would know. Don't go to him. But, but, but I'm going to give you some help. I'm going to give you some, some, some advice. And you're like, eh. Well, what about godly advice? What if God has some godly advice for you? You know what most of us do when we have big decisions? Nothing. I'm a man. I don't ask for anybody's opinion. I make my own decisions, right? And we don't bring in any... We refuse to understand that God says there's safety in the multitude of counsel. God says that. God says, don't just rely on your gut feeling on this. Talk to a few people that are godly, that, that, that you trust, and ask for their advice. And then don't ignore it. Don't just go around and find people that... Okay, she's going to say what I, what I want to hear. So let me ask you, don't you agree with me? Okay, good. And I know he'll agree with me. Would you find some people that you just know that will tell you the truth? Judah was being told the truth. Jeremiah came and said, listen, judgment is coming. God has given a remedy for it. Don't reject it. But they did. And Jeremiah's heart was broken. Because a cure was available. It was there. But they wouldn't take it. God says, I, I, I've given you that. I have provided it for you. Just take it. And they're like, no. And so now the consequences are coming. Your heart should break over something that breaks the heart. So here's the application of what we're going to do today. I want you to pray the prayer, the bold prayer. Lord, break me. Like I said, that's a, that's a, a dangerous prayer to say. We, we kind of want to be aloof. We kind of don't want to be emotional about it. And yet, that's exactly what Jeremiah was. He, he was involved with it. He was emotional. He was caught with it. And because of that, he began to see the things that everybody else around him were blind to. Are you bothered by what bothers God? 
I mean, does that really bother you, or do you just kind of go, eh? But does that really bother you? Does it cause in your life pain, tears, heartache? We need to be praying, Lord, break my heart. Lord, change my heart. I want to challenge you to pray that prayer this week. And I want to challenge you to continue our 21-day journey as we're praying boldly. I want you to continue that, as many of you have. You say, well, I, I really haven't been doing that. Well, it's better to start now than to ignore it. Now, the cure, when we're away from God, when we are ignoring Him, is always repentance. It's to recognize your desperate condition and then turn from your sin to the Savior. It's not just saying, yeah, I realize it, and you keep going. But it's to stop and to begin to to turn and say, God, I can't do this without you. I need you. And that's when God moves in and helps. If you've never done that, then I urge you today to call upon the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul would put it this way in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. He would say that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And he goes on to say in verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never trusted Christ as Savior, I pray you'd cry out to him right now and receive him. I'm going to pray, and then I want to invite those that are here to take up the challenge. And we've got next week's um, devotional guide here for you and a little gift for you to remind you about your heart. We'd love for you to say, I want to be part of this. And to express that, I want you to take these and pray. Let's stand and let me pray. Father, thank you for what you're going to do. Change my heart, Lord. Break the callousness that's upon it, Lord. Help my inactivity, Lord, to be honed in to your spirit and to follow you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.